Hello, uh, my name is Holly, and I'm the head usher for this show. And on behalf of our crew, we want to thank you for choosing a Prairie Home Companion. We wish you a very pleasant audio experience and hope that we may serve you again in the future whenever your plans call for radio listening. Now, our program will last one hour and 58 minutes, and it is our annual joke show, so please look around you and familiarize yourself with the exit nearest you. <laughs> In the unlikely event that your radio will not turn off, your seat cushion may be used to muffle the sound. And if there is anything we can do to make the program more enjoyable for you, knowing you, it's probably something we'd really rather not even think about. So forget it. I'll hear that old piano from down the avenue I smell the roses I look around for you My sweet old someone Coming through that door It's Saturday The band is playing Honey, could we ask for more? Yes, coming to you live on a spring day in St. Paul, Minnesota from the Fitzgerald Theater on Exchange Street. Minnesota Public Radio presents a live broadcast of a Prairie Home Companion with our guests Kate McKenzie, writer, actress, comedian, Julia Sweeney, humorist Roy Blunt Jr., special musical guests Rick Paul, Tom Weaver, and Rachel schlater Parton. Sue Scott, Tim Russell, Tom Keith, Rich Dworsky, and the guys all-star shoe band. Prairie Home Companion is made possible tonight by Land's End, direct merchants, where everything you buy from soft luggage to fine casual clothing is guaranteed, period. It's good to be with you on a Saturday night. I look forward to doing this show because I have no social life of my own, and uh, <laughs> this is all that I really need now in later life because I don't care for people that much. <laughs> Tonight's show is our annual joke show. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. <laughs> Hope that you enjoy our program tonight. We have all kinds of jokes in the next um, two hours, hour and uh, 54, uh, uh, 53, uh, 50. <laughs> and um, jokes about the, uh, the guy who walks into the bar. Of course, we got a bunch of those jokes. There he is. And we have jokes about how many whatever does it take to uh, unscrew a light bulb. So how many public radio hosts does it take to screw in a light bulb? Who needs light bulbs? It's radio. Exactly. <laughs> we have uh, jokes about talking animals. Oh, oh really? Yes. I hope that goats aren't going to be the butt of those jokes. Well, we'll just see. Take your turn. We have uh, some musician jokes. We'll be told by our musicians on stage. We have some Jewish jokes. We have Baptist jokes. We have uh, some engineer jokes. Now, I hope you're not going to do any jokes about blind people. <laughs> You know, you're going to hurt somebody with that cane there, <laughs> sir. That's really very dangerous. And you're scaring your dog. Yeah, well, I don't like to hear jokes about blind people. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Why did you grab your dog by the ankles and swinging him around like that? Well, I'm just looking around. I see. Okay. I was only asking. Well, a man walked into a bar And he said to the bartender, give me a beer And he said, mister, I've got no time for fun This is the Bar Association And I am a lawyer, we don't go for jokes in here So the man walked into another bar and he said to the bartender, give me a drink. And he said, mister, I don't have a drop. Can't you see this is a barber shop? The bar rooms have striped poles. Now what do you think? So the man walked into another bar. And he said to the bartender, give me a whiskey sour. He said, this is St. 
Bartholomew, Episcopal Church, and you're in my pew. And this is the Eucharist, not the fellowship hour. So the man, he walked down the street and decided he'd never ask for a drink anymore. He went home and sat in a chair, had a cup of tea and a chocolate eclair. And then he heard someone outside walked up to the door. Who's there? Carl. Carl who? Carl gets you faster there than a the bike, get it? Yes, I think I get it. Who's there? Sam and Janet. I hate to ask. Sam and Janet evening. Uh -huh. Thank you. Who's there? Fornication. Fornication who? Fornication like this, you should wear a black tie, I think. <laughs> Who's there? Amarillo. Amarillo who? Amarillo fashion cowboy. Uh, yes. I'm not gonna say it. That's okay, I'll say it. Yeah, who's there? Euripides. Euripides who? Euripides pants a brick of your face. Okay, very funny, thank you. Knock, knock. Who's there? Justin. Justin who? Just in time for supper. <laughs> You finished now? Knock, knock. Who's there? Diploma. Diploma who? Diploma's here to fix the sink. So the man walked down to the bar, and he said to the bartender, give me a white Bordeaux. And the bartender said, I've only got red, but I could give you a Chablis instead. Chablis is fine, very good. Is that for here or to go? Knock, knock! Who's there? Ida! Ida who? Ida called first, but the phone's not working. So the man sits drinking wine, and into the bar comes a grasshopper, hop, hop, hop. And the bartender said, can it really be true? We've got a drink, and it's named after you. And the grasshopper said, why would anyone Name a drink, Bob. Love that joke, I just can't hear it enough. So the man sat and drank his wine. And then came a skeleton and asked for a mop and a beer. And then a horse walked into the place. And the bartender said, how come the long face? And a hot dog came and he said, we don't serve food in here. Oh, I'm sorry. Knock, knock. Who's there? Isabel. Isabel who? Isabel not working? So the man put down his wine. He said there isn't a single one joke that I don't know. He hopped his giraffe and he waved goodbye. The little dog laughed and a winked his eye. The mathematician slice the pie and I hope that you all enjoy our joke show We do this show as a public service because uh, here in America we realize the jokes are radical and uh, subversive, they're underground. Since America was taken over by large corporations run by humorless MBAs, which all of us are prisoners in the same concentration camp virtually, required to keep our heads down, our hands busy, and jokes do not maximize profits, so they're not welcome in corporate America. But corporations have always been essentially un-American. Corporations are paramilitary organizations. And America is not a military country. It's a culture of farmers. And people who lead quiet lives. And so, because their lives are quiet and peaceful, they take pleasure in things that go wrong. Jokes are an important part of 
our culture. I hope you're taking notes on this, because I thought really hard about these points. It's part of what it means to be an American. We're a democracy. We revolted against the British, who we thought had a very poor sense of humor. Oh, really? Well, yes. Did you think so? How interesting. Yes, really. Hmm. We enjoyed pulling those people down off their high horse. <laughs> say, what are you doing now? Pulling say, them off their no. high horse and throwing them down in the no! mud with the pig. <laughs> yes. And then dumping a bucket of slop. No, no, please, no, don't do that. Oh, dear. And we've been doing that ever since, throwing people down in the mud and dumping slops. On them. It's, a, it's, a, it's one of the pleasures of comedy. It's an institution. It's an equalizer. The moment a president is elected to office, we throw him in the mud. I was kind of hoping you might make an exception in my case. Well, you were wrong, Mr. President. Yeah. We, hey. We were waiting for you. We were hoping for you. Now, listen, you're not going to throw that big whole bucket of slop on me, yes, are you? Yes, they're, they're going to do are that, they Mr. President. Do, oh, no. I was afraid of that. Oh. <laughs> In America, we feel that a person who does not tell jokes and who can't take jokes is definitely a weird person. And so, whenever people get together for lunch or in meetings or at the coffee machine or in the carpool, or your kids' car practice or soccer practice or car practice, if your kids have cars and are practicing with them, I don't know. I don't know about your lives. We like to have just a little graceful moment of jokes, if possible, to just put everybody at ease. You tell one. Okay, so that new Episcopal Church is so liberal. Yes. It has six commandments and four suggestions. I like that. <laughs> well, humorlessness is a fatal flaw in politics and most other places. And even if down deep you feel depressed and filled with rage and self-pity, you're still expected to grin and toss off a graceful line. Well, it's not so bad. One advantage is that now I can hide my own Easter eggs. Yes? <laughs> Humor is a way of dealing with the unspeakable and the horrendous. You all know that after plane crashes or disasters or mass murders or grisly crimes, there's always a wave of jokes about it. Within a day or two of the deaths of the 39 Heaven's Gate cult members out in San Diego, you started to hear jokes about them. What drove the 39 members of Heaven's Gate to suicide? Well, hey, you put that many people together and force them to work in Windows 95, it's bound to happen. Yeah. yeah. You know, I heard that some of them were Unix programmers, too. I yeah. <laughs> Jokes break the ice between people. They're the most basic way for strangers to get to know each other and friends to amuse each other. People say all the time, I can't remember jokes, but you know, you remember jokes by telling them. That's how you do it. You don't remember them by reading them or hearing them. You hear a joke that you like, you tell it twice to two other people and, and you've, you've remembered it. And if people laugh at it, then it's a funny joke. That's, it's as simple as that. Which is the sad thing about jokes on the internet. There are hundreds of news groups and talk groups that deal in jokes on the internet and the jokes sit there silent on the screen and by the way the joke is written you can just tell somehow that the person who sent that joke in never actually told it out loud <laughs> and you get the feeling that maybe that person doesn't talk to a lot of people <laughs> but just sits and looks at the screen it's too bad because jokes are part of the oral tradition. They're not a literary form. The more literary a joke is, the worse it is. Jokes are meant to be told, and when they're told right, they jump right up and they bite you in the butt. Okay, okay, okay. So the baby snake says to the mommy snake, Mommy, are we poisonous? And the mommy snake says, well, why do you ask? And the baby snake says, because I just bit my tongue. Last huh? week, uh, last week, this show put me up in a rather low-class hotel, and I called the front guy at the desk, the front desk, and he said, I said to him, I said, I got a leak in my sink, and he said, go ahead. My grandmother, she started walking five miles a day when she was 60. She's 97 today, and we don't know where the hell she is. <laughs> So a man was praying to God, and he said, God, and God said, yeah, can I ask a question? God, God said, sure, go ahead. He said, God, what is a million years to you? God said, well, to me, a million years is as a second. 
man said, what is a million dollars to you, God? God said, well, to me, a million dollars is as a penny. And the man said, God, could I have a penny? <laughs> and God said, sure, just a second. <laughs> yeah, I heard that one. Why was uh, Isaac 12 years old when God called Abraham to sacrifice him? Because if he had been a teenager, it wouldn't have been a sacrifice. <laughs> oh, yeah, sure. So, uh, anyway, Abraham decided to upgrade his PC to Windows 95, and Isaac couldn't believe it. He said, Dad, your old PC doesn't have enough memory. And Abraham said, My son, God will provide the RAM. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, Tommy goes into a confessional, see, and he says, uh, Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. I've been with a loose woman. Oh, is that you, Tommy? Yes, Father, it's me. And who was the woman you were with, then? Well, I can't tell you, Father. I... I don't want to ruin her reputation. Was it Brenda, then? No, Father. Was it Fiona? No, no, Father. Was it Anne? No, Father. Very well, Tommy. Go say five Our Fathers and four Hail Marys. So Tommy goes back to his pew and sits down, and his pal Sean slides over and asks, hey, what happened? Tommy says, well, I got five Our Fathers, four Hail Marys, and three good leads. <laughs> Okay, you like that one? You're going to love this one. This guy uh, goes into confession, and uh, he says to the priest, Father, I'm 80 years old, married, have four kids and 11 grandkids, and last night I had this affair. I made love to two 18-year-old girls, both of them, twice. And the priest said, Well, my son, when was the last time you were at confession? Never, Father, I'm Jewish. <laughs> so then, why are you telling me? I'm telling everybody. Oh, okay. Okay, this is a Baptist joke here. Um, there were three couples who wanted to get into the Baptist church, and the pastor said, fine, but uh, we do have this requirement for new parishioners. You have to abstain from sex for two weeks. You think you can do that? Fine. They, well, we'll try, they said. So they were gone for two weeks. They came back two weeks later. He turned to them. He said, uh, okay, let me just ask you. Uh, he turned to the elderly couple, and he said, uh, were you able to uh, do uh, what uh, I asked? Oh, sure, they said. That was no problem. We didn't, didn't bother us at all. He turned to the middle-aged couple, and he said, uh, were you able to, uh, you know, abstain? And they said, well, it was not that hard the first week, but the second week we had to be careful and sleep in separate beds. But yes, we got through the two weeks. Fine, he said, welcome to the Baptist church. He turned to the young couple. He said, were you able to, uh... well, actually, Reverend Man said, uh, the second day, my wife reached up for a light bulb off the top shelf, and she dropped it, and she bent over it to pick it up, and I could not control myself. And we made love right there on the floor. Well, he said to you, you're not welcome in the Baptist church. Well, I don't care, the man said. We're not welcome in the grocery store either. <laughs> All right, speaking of uh, light bulbs, as we were just a moment ago, let's, uh, let's take up this classic form and some new, some new issues that have just come in. How many Zen masters does it take to change a light bulb? Two, one to change it and one not to change it. How many surrealists does it take to screw in a light bulb? Two, one to hold the giraffe and one to put the clocks in the bathtub. <laughs> How many telemarketers does it take to change a light bulb? Only one, but they have to do it while you're eating dinner. Oh, yeah. So how many uh, reference librarians does it take to screw in a light bulb? I don't know. I'll have to check on that and get back to you. Okay. How many bluegrass musicians does it take to change a light bulb? Four, mm -hmm. one to change it, and three to complain that it's electric. <laughs> How many chiropractors does it take to change a light bulb? One, but it takes them three visits. Mm. <laughs> How many communists does it take to screw in a light bulb? The light bulb contains the seeds of its own revolution. <laughs> How many Lutherans does it take to change a light bulb? Five, one to screw in the new bulb, and four to talk about how much they'll miss the old one. <laughs> How many men does it take to change a toilet paper roll? Who knows? It's never happened. <laughs> so, uh, 
uh, would you like a cup of coffee? No, no, thanks. When I drink coffee, I can't sleep. Huh. In my case, it's the other way around. When I sleep, I can't drink coffee. <laughs> so this woman is visiting in Israel. She notices her little travel alarm clock needs a battery. So she looks around for a watch repair shop, but she can't read Hebrew. Finally, she sees a shop with clocks and watches in the window. Goes in and hands the man a check, a clock. And he says, Madam, I don't repair clocks. I'm a rabbi. I do cir circumcisions. She says, well, why all the clocks in the window? He says, well, so what should I have in the window? <laughs> so there was this man who entered a pun contest, and he sent in 10 different puns, you know, in the hope that at least one of the puns would win, and unfortunately, no pun in 10 did. Uh, the, uh, doctor, uh, I feel like a pair of curtains. Come now, pull yourself together. Next! Uh, doctor, there's an invisible man in your waiting room. Well, tell him I can't see him now. Next! Doctor, my fingers hurt. Do you think I should file my nails? No, just throw them away. Next! What's wrong? Why am I in a hospital? Well, you've had an accident. What happened? Well, I've got some good news and some bad news. What's the bad news? We had to amputate both your legs. Oh, no. Yeah. What's the good news? We found a guy who's made a very good offer on your shoes. Oh. Doctor, I don't know what's wrong with me, but I hurt all over. If I touch my shoulder here, it hurts. And if, if I touch my leg here, it hurts. And mm. if I touch my head here, it hurts. And if I touch my foot here, it hurts. Mm. And... I believe you've broken your finger. Mm. <laughs> what's, what's wrong, Doctor? You, you look puzzled. Well, I can't figure out exactly what's wrong with you. I, I think it's the result of heavy drinking. Well, then I'll just come back when you're sober. Uh, uh, Mrs. Larson... Uh, you're not going deaf in your left ear. You seem to have a suppository stuck in there. Well, now I know what happened to my hearing aid. You know how deaf Beethoven was? Beethoven was so deaf, he thought he was painting. No. Oh. Hello? Is this the fire department? Yeah. Listen, my house is on fire. You've got to come right away. It's terrible. Okay, how do we get to your house? You don't have those big red trucks anymore? met a pirate in a bar, and the sailor couldn't help but notice that the pirate was pretty badly the worse for wear. He'd had a peg leg, a hook, and an eye patch. So the sailor asked the pirate how he got the peg leg, and the pirate answered, Well, matey, I got washed overboard one night while we was in a fierce storm, and durn me if a shark didn't go and bite off me leg. Then the sailor asked, So how'd you get the hook? And the pirate answered, Well, we was in a fierce fight while boarding a ship one time, and that's when I got me my hand cut off. Finally, the sailor asked, so how'd you get the eye patch? And the pirate responded, a seagull pooped in me eye. To which the sailor repri replied, you mean to tell me that you lost an eye just because a seagull pooped in it? And the pirate said, well, it was the first day I had the hook. Ouch. So, uh, so a woman, uh, a woman died, and she went to heaven, and St. Peter took her on a tour of heaven, and they uh, passed a pit where there were some people gnashing their teeth and wailing, and the woman said, um, so who's down there? And St. Peter said, oh, those are the Catholics who ate meat on Fridays. So they, okay, they walked a little further, and there was another pit with more groaning and wailing and gnashing, and she said, okay, who's down there? And St. Peter said, oh, those are the Baptists who went to dances. Okay, so they walked a little further, and there was another pit, and people down there gnashing their teeth and ripping their garments. And she said, okay, so who are those people? And St. Peter said, those are the Episcopalians who ate their salads with their dessert forks. Okay, so three people are going to the guillotine. The first is a lawyer. He puts his head on the block, guy pulls the lanyard, nothing happens. So they let him go. Second one's the doctor. He puts his head on the block, guy pulls the thing. Again, the blade doesn't come down. They gotta let him go. Third guy's an engineer. He go goes up to the block and says, do you mind if I lie face up? And they said, yeah, okay. So he lies down there. He looks up and says, wait, 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 wait. I think I see your problem. <laughs> Madam Fortune Teller, tell me, are there golf courses in heaven? I have good news and I have bad news. What's the good news? The good news is that the golf courses in heaven are beautiful beyond anything you could imagine. That's wonderful. And you'll be teeing off at 8.30 tomorrow morning. Oh. 
So a man and his wife were driving home one night, and they ran into this bridge abutment, and both were killed. And so they arrived in heaven and found out that it was, it, it, was, it was nothing but this beautiful golf course with this wonderful clubhouse and, and fabulous greens, and everything was free, and everything was for them. And the husband said, well, you want to play around? And she said, sure. So they teed off on the first hole, and then she looked at him, and she said, well, well, what's wrong? And he said, you know, if it hadn't been for your stupid oat bran, we could have been here years ago. <laughs> Okay, so four big executives, they're out golfing together, and on the second tee, they hear a phone ring, and Michael Eisner reaches down into his golf bag, and he pulls out a cellular phone, and he talks to his office for a while, and they go on, they play the second hole, and on the third tee, there's a little buzz, and Warren Buffett puts one finger in his ear and one finger to his mouth, and he talks, and afterward, he explains that he has this little tiny microphone that's installed in one fingernail and a little speaker installed in another, so we can always keep in touch with his office. So everybody's impressed by that. They go on to the third hole, and on the fourth tee, suddenly Ted Turner just starts talking. He talks for a while. They're all amazed. And afterward, he explains that he has a microphone in a filling in a lower tooth, and he has a little speaker implanted in his earlobe so that he can always be in touch with the office no matter what. They're even more impressed, and they move on, and then suddenly they see Bill Gates pull his pants down and squat and reach into his golf bag for a roll of toilet paper. And he looks up and he says, it's okay, I'm just expecting a fax. How does a man take a bubble bath? He eats beans for dinner. Oh. <laughs> Hear about the ship that ran aground and was carrying a cargo of red paint and black paint? Mm -hmm. The whole crew was marooned. No. Yeah. So how do you make a bandstand? Take away their chairs. Yeah, so what do you say to a hitchhiker with one leg? Hop in. Yeah, yeah what do you call a dog with no legs? It doesn't matter, he's not going to come anyway. <laughs> so uh, what's Irish and sits outside? Uh, patio furniture. <laughs> what's green and skates? Peggy Flynn. Mm. What's Mary short for? Yeah, she's got little legs, I guess. Oh. <laughs> Say, did you hear about the corduroy pillows? Yeah, they're making headlines, aren't they? So what uh, is the difference between ignorance, apathy, and ambivalence? I don't know, and I don't care one way or another. <laughs> so uh, what did the arts graduate say to the engineering graduate? Would you like fries with your order, sir? <laughs> Do you think that Moses led the Israelites through the desert for 40 years because God was testing him, or because he wanted them to really appreciate the promised land when they finally got there, or because Moses simply refused to ask anybody for direction? Did you hear the one about the snail that got beat up by two turtles? No. Yeah. yeah, he went to the police and they asked him, did you get a good look at the turtles who did this? And he says, nah, it all happened so fast. So there's this uh, horse tied up at a hitching post, and this little dog comes along and starts playing around the horse. And the horse gets a little annoyed by this, and he starts pawing the ground. And the dog looks up and says, you know, what are you doing that for? And the horse looks down and says, well, I'll be damned, a talking dog. <laughs> See, the dog was talking. <laughs> North Dakota jokes. North Dakota jokes. I love them. How is a divorce in, how is a divorce in North Dakota like a hurricane in Florida? Either way, you lose the trailer. <laughs> What's a seven-course meal in North Dakota? A hamburger and a six-pack. <laughs> Two North Dakotans, North Dakotans rented a boat, went out in the lake, and caught 30 fish in this spot. So they said, listen, we better mark this spot. Put a big X in the bottom of the boat. <laughs> Second North Dakotan said, wait just a minute. What if we don't get the same boat? <laughs> Okay, the train for Chicago leaves at 1.15. Train for Duluth leaves at 1.30. Train for Fargo leaves when the big hand is on the nine and the little hand is on the one. So two North Dakotans are skydiving. One jumps out of the plane and pulls the cord. Nothing happens. So he pulls the emergency cord and still nothing. The other one jumps out of the plane and yells, Oh, so you want to race, huh? <laughs> So this old woman is sitting on a rocking chair on her porch there, and she's petting her cat Puff, and a fairy uh, shows up and says, I'm here to give you three wishes. And the old woman says, well, I wish I were 21 years old and beautiful again. Poof, she is. Wow. Now I wish uh, I had a million dollars in this old house or a mansion. Bang, it's done. And uh, now she says, I wish that Puff 
here were the handsomest man in the world and deeply in love with me. Poof! Suddenly, the beautiful 21-year-old woman is in the arms of the handsomest man in the world. He kisses her. He says, Darling, aren't you sorry you had me fixed? The best part about owning a restaurant for cats is that your customers don't complain when they get hair in their food. Actually, the best part about fighting your way to the top of the food chain is that you can choose to be a vegetarian or not. Now, the best part about computers is that they make very fast, accurate mistakes. My software never has bugs. It just develops random features. I've seen the truth, and it makes no sense. According to my calculations, the problem doesn't exist. 24 hours in a day. (laughs) 24 hours in a day. Thank you. 24 hours in a day, 24 beers in a case. Coincidence? Uh. Yeah. Once I killed a six-pack just to watch it die. <laughs> I was so drunk they had to pay duty on me to get me through customs. Do you know why you should always invite two Baptists to go fishing with you? Because if you only invite one, he'll drink all your beer. Invite two and they won't drink any. You know, actually, sex on television can't hurt you, unless you fall off. Uh. <laughs>